when I was invited, and thank you very much for the invitation, I was thinking uh, about what to present because I'm doing some uh, measurements in collaboration with Paolo Vavassori and actually my former postdoc, Nicolò Macaferi, about ultrafast magnetoplasmonics that perfectly fit the topic of the conference, but it's not my problem. It's the problem of Nicolò, uh, and I was basically providing the, the background uh, knowledge on ultrafast. So uh, actually, I, I decided for something different that is not on topic in the sense that you will not hear one's magnetism, but this is trends, and I hope it's something that in, I don't know, five to 10 years, it will be something that can be used uh, in your community in a quite nice way. Uh, and the thing is that uh, most of the experimentalists that I've heard do here do optics uh, measurements on, on magnetic problems in general, or uh, transport. And uh, uh, the thing is that the two things can be combined. Uh, the, uh, the basic idea is that you can use the electric field of light as a bias. It's an oscillating field, but it's still an electric field that you can harness. And the, uh, the idea that we had, it's relatively simple. Imagine to have uh, a circuit with a very small gap that makes the circuit open. And if this gap is very small, uh, that's a tunneling junction. So what you can do when you apply a, a field to such a junction, when this, the, the field starts to become stronger and stronger, you, you start to have a current. What if we use the electric field of light applied to such a junction in order to bias the two metallic contacts and induce the tunneling of electrons through the gap? Well, at that point, we can have a transport measurement because we are inducing transport of electrons through, through the gap at optical frequencies with the temporal resolution that can be given by doing these experiments with ultrafast optic source. And actually, uh, it's not only possible, but it's also necessary to use ultrafast tools. Uh, because the, the concept is that we need to rely on the fact that the tunnel injunction has a nonlinear current voltage characteristic, as you can see here. This is just a sketch. But imagine that you have just a closed circuit, a metallic ring, or whatever. If you shine light on a metal, uh, the, the plasma frequency is much higher than the, the optical frequency that you're going to use the, the, uh, the transport. The electrons are just going to wiggle around and just, in average, after the pulse has passed, they will not change position or momentum. They will stay where they were. They will keep the properties that they had at the beginning. But if the characteristic of the system is nonlinear, this means that the fact that the propagating pulse that has an integral of the electric field over time equals zero starts to matter if the pulse is very short, because I'm going to have a specific peak of electric field due to the fact that it's short, the pulse is short, that in a nonlinear characteristic system is going to matter much more than the others. So at some point, this peak is going to dominate the process and is going to drive the current in one direction. And ideally, if I have a single cycle pulse, I'm able to do that with the maximum efficiency because every side peak will be lower enough that is not driving the current uh, at all. So uh, the longer the pulses, the more I'm going to wash out the effect because the electric field is going to, every cycle of my radiation is going to drive opposite currents and I wash it out. So I need single cycle pulses. Not only, here is not a, an optics community, but you have to, to imagine that generating single cycle optical pulses is a huge challenge by itself. But there is a second challenge, and the challenge is that if you buy a femtosecond laser, uh, the pulses are not going to be all equal to each other. You are going to have a random, let, it's not random, but let's say uh, the specific profile of the electric field is going to be different from pulse to pulse for several reasons. So the other trick is that you need to have it reproducible and controllable. And in addition, you, you need to be able to change the polarization to go to, let's say, cosine like to minus cosine to drive the current in the direction that you want. If you are cosine-like, you are going to have zero current, okay? So these are some ingredients from, from, the optical cycle, from the optical side that are needed in order to achieve transport on ultrafast time scales and being able to measure it. There is another um, ingredient that actually it's not specifically needed, but it's very helpful. This tunneling process is a strong field phenomenon. It's, it's a high nonlinearity order or it's non-perturbative in a sense. So we can also benefit from the fact that we can even enhance the optical field that we are 
using for our system. So we can use plasmonic antennas. We can use plasmonic antennas and embed them in a circuit so that the gap, the nano, the nano size gap that we're going to use actually is the feed gap of an antenna in which we can provide even a field enhancement so we can even enhance the optical uh, bias that we are going to uh, induce at the gap uh, of the antenna. And this is uh, antennas that we have made. Uh, they are fabricated by electron beam lithography and they have a very nice uh, tunneling characteristics if we study them in, uh, in CW with electronics. There is also another important ingredient. We are dealing with very short pulses. We want that every system that is interacting with our pulses is not reducing the bandwidth of the response. A single cycle pulse requires a lot of colors at the same time in a coherent fashion to generate a single um, period of the optical radiation. So we need also that these, the optical response of these plasmonic antennas have to be as broad as possible. And both eyes are perfect for that because they are kind of providing very good uh, uh, field enhancement. They have a very sharp tip. Plus they are, th their shape is triangular, so they are not good oscillators. They are kind of broadband intrinsically. So, to develop this kind of technology, it's a long story. We started a lot of years ago de developing the laser systems to do these, uh, these kind of, uh, of experiments. And actually, the motivation to move in, the, in transport was because we had a very ideal source for that. We developed a, a, a fiber laser operating at high repetition rate, meaning that we can have a lot of um, events in, in, the, in, the uni, in the unit of time. We have single cycle pulses. This uh, was published 10 years, more than 10 years ago. And we have a very nice way of controlling this, this carrier envelope phase. You, have, you see all the optical references in, uh, uh, in this slide. So the, the experiment then uh, becomes rather conceptually simple. We have our special source in which we generate these single cycle pulses with controllable uh, shape of the electric field. Uh, we have our short pulses and we focus them on, on a single antenna and, and a, single, a single circuit in which we can measure the current, thus the transport happening at the nano gap. Um, the, there are some nice technical details about that. We can con completely decouple the temporal duration from the control of the CP. This is one of the optical challenges that, that you have doing these experiments. Typically, if you want to do the two things, they start to be coupled. The temporal duration will be coupled in some way in a, in a way you control the CP, but fine, we can do all these things. And then we can uh, change, so we can arbitrarily change the, the, the profile shape of our pulse and look at the current that we induce. So this is the first measurement that we did. Um, and these are uh, the, this is the characterization of the pulses. Uh, I can go quickly. So we have, we, in those experiments, we had six femtosecond pulses. That is roughly 1.4 optical cycle at the carrier frequency, but we have a clear, uh, this is strong, strongly nonlinear phenomenon. So the fact that uh, the field at the peak is even 10% higher than the side peaks on these, uh, on, on, on the opposite polarity, it, it has a huge impact on the measurement. And then we did the measurement by controlling the carrier envelope phase, so this is a characterization of that via F2 to F um, spectrogram. So here you see when the pulses have the, 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 the same carrier envelope phase, and then we let them scan through it, okay? And we measure the current, we collect the current. And this is the measurement. Uh, it's not. Yeah, so, scanning the carrier envelope phase, we measure a current that is completely modulated with the periodicity at which control the carrier envelope phase. So we have basically a circuit that we close with light. It can act as a diode, if you will, but it's a diode that is closed by the electric field of the radiation, not by the absorption of photons. Um, and in addition, it's even better than a diode because it can completely revert the direction of the current. Okay, because this just follows the polarity of the electric field that is impinging on, on the nano gap. And they can do all sorts of studies of how the transport occurs at this nano gap. Uh, it's of, of course, it's a strongly nonlinear phenomenon. It's a tunneling. Uh, I need to, uh, to have a high probability of passing an electron through a barrier. Plus, uh, there are some other ingredients there that I can discuss in a moment. Uh, the gap is still quite big in reality for a, for a complete tunneling. It's 
roughly 10 nanometers. So in reality, what we have in this specific experiment is tunneling of the electron in free space and then a ballistic uh, closure of the circuit by the electron that reaches the second contact. Uh, but nothing prevents to fill the gap with different geometries with the material that you want to study for the transport in the material itself. So we study the, the propagation of the electrons into the material itself, and of course, if the field is not strong enough, first of all, I might not have tunneling at all. If the, the field is strong enough, I have tunneling, and then the electron starts to wiggle between the electrodes, and if the field is strong enough, I can close the circuit within half a cycle of the optical radiation, thus having uh, a temporary resolution that's shorter than half a cycle of the optical pulses. And we had a, a very nice collaboration with Javier Aizipuru and Andrei Borisov that did the full modeling of this process occurring in the gap via uh, TDDFT calculations of a model system much smaller than an actual plasmonic antenna, but let's say considering the classical properties of plasmonic antennas and uh, the quantum mechanics of the transport within the gap. Uh, after that, we improved even more our temporal resolution, we, were, we managed to make the, our pulses even shorter. Now we are truly at the limit of single cycle. Uh, we improved just, just by 0.4 of a cycle, from 1.4 to one cycle, and the, 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 the process become dramatically more efficient. Before we were, we were measuring roughly one electron every 20 pulses, operating at 80 megahertz, so still very easy to measure. Uh, with these pulses at the maximum uh, powers that we can exploit, we have up to five electrons per pulse. Okay, so imagine five electrons that are funneled in a nanometric uh, dimensions uh, in one femtosecond. So that the current densities are also huge. So there are very important ph quantum phenomena that are occurring in the transport itself. And in this way, we can start also to access the time domain aspect. We did autocorrelation with two pulses driving the phenomenon as a function of the time delay between the two pulses and as a function of the carrier envelope phase, because that's another degree of freedom that we can, we can measure. That's something that you cannot do when you do standard autocorrelations. The, the, the carrier envelope phase will be completely irrelevant in those kind of measurements. And this is the kind of map that, that you get. Uh, might be not easy to, to visualize, but if you do a cut at CP equals zero, so when the pulse is perfectly cosine shaped, this is how an autocorrelation looks like. So, uh, the central spike, that is the, the, uh, the central event when the two pulses are perfectly overlapping, shows what can be the temporary solution in such kind of, uh, of experiment. These, here we are below one femtosecond, okay? Because it's much shorter than the optical cycle of the radiation, because we are looking at, uh, at a strong nonlinear effect that is driven by the central field of it. And we see some features that are completely different from the normal situation. We can uh, numerically simulate these results, again, with a full DFT calculation, so everything is fine. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that, depending on the shape on the antenna and the specific experimental condition, we can go from uh, perfectly uh, exponential curves, that is what you expect from driving such a strong field effect, to some situation in which we start to see saturations. So we start to see the bottleneck of the current transport uh, at such time scales, due to the fact that you, you start to, to have Coulomb-Coulomb interaction. Um, and the interesting thing uh, in, is that all these experiments that are strong field experiments are happening at very low power uh, pulse energies. We are below, uh, we are at, at two picojoules to, to observe, you see, these effects, but we can go towards femtojoule um, pulse energies to measure this kind of phenomena. So very, very low optical powers that start to become very interesting to study phenomena at, na at the nanoscale. So this has a lot of implication on transport in free space and in bulk material because we, we can always think about putting a material in between, maybe doing a different geometry to metallic contact with a layer in between, cleave and illuminate from the side. So a lot of different possibilities there. Transport in magnetic material, you can use also some, uh, some metals that uh, will, uh, will have a, a majority spin uh, in, in, in the current that you inject. Uh, but there is also another uh, interesting perspective uh, because um, uh, 
the idea directly can be um, ported to a technique that is heavily used in your field, that is scanning tun uh, tunneling microscopy. And this field was pioneered in very recent years by a lot of people, Rupert Tuber, Frank Eggman, uh, doing uh, terahertz-driven um, STM. The point is that terahertz-driven STM has a temporal resolution of 100, um, 100 femtoseconds and up uh, picoseconds. Uh, with driving these with near infrared, mid infrared radiation, uh, you could do STM uh, with femtosecond temporal resolution. And uh, these are uh, results obtained in the very last months. We are preparing a publication about it. Uh, I don't know if you see, but in our STM that has full uh, optical access, all the measurements are done at the moment at room temperature, because that's the interesting thing, doing the thing uh, with optics at uh, and looking at the demodulation of, uh, at optical frequencies, we can still do the things uh, at, at room temperature. Maybe some interesting phenomena will come up when we go at lower temperature. But then we do our STM and we have, we, we shine our, our short pulses at the tip of the STM and we see that we can modulate the transport again at the camera of phase of our pulses and soon will come the time domain experiments in which we are exploiting these to study uh, temporal dynamics with atomic uh, resolution. With the goal, my personal goal is more going towards uh, molecules and observing uh, orbitals and charge um, localization on uh, electronic systems. So for example, imagine a, a molecule from homo lumo transition, the electron localizes in a different direction and observing the electron that moves around in a molecule. But uh, nothing prevents to apply this technique to uh, other transport phenomena in which, for example, the spin uh, might be relevant. So, uh, in conclusion, I hope to show you that uh, this is a very promising technique that can be used to couple optics and electronic transport so that electronic transport can access temporal resolutions that uh, are accessible only to optics uh, and with uh, future uh, exciting um, possibilities. Um, of course, I have to thank all the people that were involved in this series of work, first in Constance, that was my previous affiliation, and right now uh, in Luxembourg, uh, and the, the collaboration with the theoreticians that did the modeling, uh, the DDFT modeling about the transport of uh, the electrons within the gap. And with this, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>